Hi, my name is Renee Kirby. I'm the parent coordinator at Maryland School for the Blind. And uh, this is our first webinar of the school year. Um, I have with us uh, Dr. Josh Egic. He is the principal of our academic program. Um, and how long have you been here, Josh? 16 years. 16 years with uh, MSB. Um, he's gonna present today on technology benchmarks for your blind or visually impaired child. Um, we're gonna put up a, a PowerPoint and at the end, um, there'll be a question answer uh, portion. So um, enjoy the webinar and um, you'll also be able to see this webinar. Um, it'll be archived on our uh, website and um, this actual, uh, the, this whole uh, PowerPoint will be on our website also um, in a couple of weeks, correct? Yeah, the PowerPoint and the, uh, the checklist that we're talking about. All right, so enjoy. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Not seeing anything. Let's hope people can hear me. I'm just making sure we're. Ooh. I guess that's a. I'll say that's a. Hopefully, hopefully everyone's hearing me. Um. So we will. I can unmute for a second. There's a chat. I can. Okay, good. People can hear me. Very good. I'm glad. Um, all right, so let's see here. All right, so bear with us for one second as we play with the uh, play with this for one for a minute. All right, so as I said, I'm uh, Dr. Josh Ejic. I'm the principal of our academic program here, so that covers first through twelfth grade, um, and we're going to talk today about some technology benchmarks and just how we have been handling it here at the school and just some things to think about with, you know, whether a student goes to the school for the blind or they attend a, a public school or somewhere else, just how you can kind of use something like the, this or something like it to, um, you know, to, to work with, with the educational team to understand where a student may need to go in terms of their technology skills, uh, give a little history of how we came up to this and then just walk you through a few of the things that we did. And certainly at the end, I'll be happy to, you know, to take questions um, or even throughout, you know, there's a chat so you can, uh, you know, throw a question in there too. And, you know, we can certainly try to address it later. So I'm going to move to the PowerPoint now. So I'm going to share the screen. Uh, there we go. And now people should be able to see a, uh, a presentation has now come up. So hopefully that's the case. We will find out here soon. So first thing, and you know, and you can either participate in the poll here if you're able to, or just sort of think about it is, you know, what technology is your child using now? Or what, what technology are you aware of to that they're, uh, how they're accessing their educational or even leisure and personal materials. So there's a poll up, you can either go to the website listed at the very top here, or you can go, you can text to the number 22333 and then enter my name followed by 701 and then text in an answer. So we'll give everyone a second to, uh, to do that. If it doesn't work, we'll, start, we'll, we'll move on here. Hopefully it's working. We will find out here. So I don't know. Can everyone see the screen? There's a, uh, there's a, uh, it says at the top, what technology does your child use? So hopefully you can see that at the top of the screen or at the top of the presentation. So if you're listening, you don't see it. it that's, that's the question I'm asking. And then our, uh, 
Oh, so, so, yeah, so someone's responding through chat, so CCTV is one, okay. So and we'll talk about a few of the other things that are out there. So, and what I will say today too, is a lot of what we're going to discuss in terms of technology is really, um, we're gonna look more at PC and iPad based types of technology, things that are um, slightly, you know, sp using specialized software, but slightly less specialized hardware. So things that would be more commonly seen in a, in a school or, you know, they, um, not that students aren't using these things in a school, but things that you would, um, uh, you know, you could purchase commercially or that entire classrooms would be using versus uh, one student at a CCTV or one student using maybe something like a Braille note taker. Um, so, and someone asked a question, using iBooks for reading, uh, is that what I mean? And so I, I was really sort of asking what, what any, any possible technologies that you might you know, see out, out there. So as I said, what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at, you know, there's, a, there's a checklist scope and sequence that we use here at the school uh, that, you know, is being update, that is updated, that we've just updated, um, but we've had in place since 2014. Um, so we're gonna go over a little bit of that. We're also gonna take a look at why is this, you know, why is something like this important? Talk a little bit about development and how really what the, the point of something like this is, is to put tools in a toolbox for any student. So, and, but there are some things out there that are a little bit more, you, you know, you see a little bit more universally. Um, so any student who wants to go on to college or a career, you know, this is still a very PC centered world. Some places use Mac or you can even use iPads in certain places, but for the most part, you're, we're looking at a lot of PC access. Um, and then, you know, at the end, we're gonna talk a little bit about how, you know, how do you use something like this to focus student time, you know, given that any student, you know, is only in school six and a half hours a day, and they definitely, you know, they, they still need to go to math class and to history class and to English class and can't just spend all of their time working on technology. So how do you sort of focus this and integrate it into classes uh, and then support it at home? as well. Oops, jumped. So I have on the screen here for anyone who can see it, just a few historical and one newer device. Um, but this was, you know, these things are, uh, you know, the Kurzweil reading machine. Um, next to that is a picture of a device called an Opticon, which used a little camera and then some pins in a, uh, in a machine to, oops, uh, to braise tactile letters under someone's finger. And then one of the, ori you know, the original Braille and Speak, which was a Braille, you know, sort of a Braille note taker, but prior to refreshable Braille displays. And then next to that is the newer, uh, the much newer Humanware Touch, which is a Braille note taker, but uses an Android based system. So, uh, so everything's very Google, you know, centered around Google. And you know, the Kurzweil and the Opticon and the Braille and Speak for a long time were the best and only options for assistive technology uh, for access to reading. Now, I'm not talking about enlargement. This is really access to literacy at this point. Now, certainly enlargement and CCTVs played a very large role for students with low vision and for adults with low vision. Uh, these things were a little bit more centered on uh, students in, uh, you know, students who were, you know, who were Braille readers or did not have enough uh, functional vision to access print. Um, and, you know, so things like this, the Kurzweil, the original Kurzweil reading machine, which was the size of a, about the size of a refrigerator, uh, and cost $50,000 was the sort of the original, you know, some of the origination of, of assistive technology for students who are blind or visually, or, and adults. Um, so obviously at $50,000, there were not a lot of these out there. I think that in the city of New York, there was three of them at one, at one time. So. And then you go to, you know, you jump ahead to a little bit more to today. So I have a picture here of a student on an iPad using a Braille display. Um, next to that is a PC, again, using a Braille display with a screen reader, JAWS. Um, and then I, you know, we have an iPhone. So iPhones and iPads use voiceover. They also come in with built-in enlargement uh, capability through Zoom, yeah, through uh, their built-in program called Zoom. 
And then next to that is a fairly new um, Braille display uh, coming out from the American Printing House for the Blind. And this would be the first Braille display that costs uh, $500, which is, you know, for anyone who, who is around students who use Braille, know that's actually very, quite inexpensive, where a lot of the Braille displays cost $1,500 or more. So, and, and my point in showing this is with iPads, with laptops, with uh, iPhones, accessibility is becoming much more commercially available. You have a lot, you know, a lot more time and a lot more capability, I'm sorry, to, to go to an Apple store, to go to Best Buy, to go to Target, pick something up and it is out of the box accessible, where in the past with these sorts of devices, that was not something you could do. These were very specialized devices and very expensive devices. So, what is this scope and sequence? And really, it's you know a checklist to to see where your student, you know, where your child is, or for us at a school to determine where's a student in terms of their needs to access education and literacy. So we built this, and I'm going to show it. I'm going to show it in a few minutes. Um, it is a very, it's a fairly large document, um, but it's built by grade level, and everything is made to build sequentially from very basic navigation up to you know, increasing in complexity and independence. So what you expect of a kindergartner or first grader to be able to do on a computer is not what you expect an 11th or 12th grader to be able to do on a computer. So we built these skills and we added in software as they got older that would be expected of any student, regardless of visual impairment or any other disability, to be able to access uh, the school environment. Um, and also with something like this is you can use this to integrate access technology into, um, into the day. So it's taking what any student would need to know how to use, say something like Microsoft Word or Microsoft PowerPoint, and looking at what skills does a student who uses enlargement or a student who uses a screen reader need in addition to successfully and independently access those, those devices or those, so those pieces of software in a classroom. Um, with the hope that you're eventually going to move on to a student sitting there working with their peers as independent, you know, or, you know, or independently as the class allows and how and as the rest of the class does. Um, and certainly, you know, we'll talk about this in a minute. No, no technology should replace literacy, but as students age um, and books, especially as, as you look towards post-secondary education, uh, literacy access really is, become, is becoming very dependent on technology. So um, students using either Braille note takers or um, computers or iPhones or iPads, you know, they can get their materials in seconds instead of weeks. So, and again, sort of why did we develop this? Again, we, you know, some of it was just a need that we had to track what a student was doing and look at their sequence through the grade levels. Um, you know, and here, you know, at a school for the blind, we often get students that don't start here in first grade and move their way through 12th grade. They may come in in middle school, they may come in in high school. So this was also a nice way for us to, to evaluate a student and see, well, okay, well, how do we, what are we gonna do now? And wh where do we go with this student to get them up to speed in the time that they have left either with us or within any school system? Um, <clears throat> we wanted to ensure that we were aligned to industry and state standards. So we did use, you know, when this was developed, we did use the Maryland um, technology literacy frameworks um, to integrate, to make sure we were aligned with what the rest of the state was doing in terms of what a student needs for technology uh, literacy. Um, and we also made sure to include other industry standards. Um, and I've jumped over now from the power, you know, from the presentation to the ISTE standards, which are what most schools use when they build a curriculum for uh, technology. So this is what you expect students to be able to do. So become an empowered learner, you know, di di uh, digital citizenship, um, being able to build their own knowledge, um, innovate, you know, use computational thinking, um, communicate, and then also collaboration. And I think what we're looking at now, it, and we're seeing some success with is many more students are using these things for collaboration where that was not as possible before. 
um, you know, with older devices that really required an intermediary step or an intermediary person to make it so any student sitting in a class could inter you know could interact with their peers. There usually had to be someone or something in between that. And now with things like Google Classroom, Google Docs, students who are blind or visually impaired can be collaborating on the exact same devices and materials as their non-disabled peers in the same room without a, an additional step in between. But that takes time to learn how to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, and we want, you know, the, with these benchmarks, we wanted to make sure that, you know, sort of the more common technology skills for any student included those access skills that are, you know, students who, with a visual impairment need. Um, and the other thing we've seen success with here is we are now seeing a lot more of our technology instructors doing things within a classroom versus just having to pull a student out and instruct them either one-to-one -one or in small group or in some sort of special class because we have very common tools that everyone can use um, and a lot of this learning can happen at the same time that anyone else is you know accessing the curriculum now certainly there are times when we have to do pull out and we have to have students given some more specialized instruction either because maybe they're more behind for some reason or you know invariably we have something that needs to be you know we need to troubleshoot excuse me for one second all right so and then you know talk you know i can talk a little bit about how we develop this and where we are now uh, so as i said we use those ISTE standards and we used materials from a variety of sources there are many sources out there things from the texas school for the blind the california school for the blind everyone's you know got different pieces as far as i know this is the yeah this is the one the one that we have is the only one i've seen that is break, breaks everything down by grade level um, but there are many checklists and uh, assessments out there for, for technology and assistive technology in particular. Uh, so we definitely use those materials, but we wanted to make sure that our, our things were also aligned, and hopefully it'll come up here. Maybe not. Um, are aligned to, our, you know, to what we're doing here within the state as well. And doesn't look like it's going to load. Sorry. That's all right. No, no, it's it worked. It worked. Worked five minutes ago. It's not working now. Nothing anyone did. Okay, so we're just going to skip that for now. Um, but that'll be that link will be in the PowerPoint once it's posted. So if anyone wants to take a look at that, um, you, internet. yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, maybe your internet connection will be quicker than mine. So, um, but there is a, there are state there's a state framework for technology literacy. So we integrated those pieces as well because you, we wanted to ensure that you know students who are blind or visually impaired are working at the same or at least a similar pace as a student who is not. And I say same or similar because any student who's blind or visually impaired has so much to do in any given time. And that's what we talk about later when we talk about how do you focus your energy is you know, students need to learn how to use um, enlargement. They need to learn how to use CCTVs. They need to learn how to use specialized software. They may need to learn Braille or and to, to take all of that and expect that you can do the exact same thing as everyone else in the room, especially at younger ages, is it, tough. And you don't necessarily want to put that kind of pressure on anybody because especially at younger ages, you want to focus on literacy, whether it be in print or in braille. Um, and literacy both in reading and writing, but also in mathematics. Um, so, you know, especially at the early grades, we have some very basic navigation skills that are fairly in line with what any non-disabled student would be doing. I mean, you don't see a lot of, you know, it's getting you know more and more rigorous, but you don't see a lot of first graders doing really deep uh, internet navigation within a school. But you, you know, you see them doing some very basic um, moving from place to place. And we want our students to be doing the exact same thing. Um, and then, yeah, so we had, you know, and then we have the skills checklist that, and the sequence focuses on you know, again, as I said, accessing more commonly used and available tools, not that those things that are specialized like note takers or CCTVs are not extremely important and should definitely be part of a, any student's toolbox. Uh, th this checklist just focused more on um, PCs and, and iPads and, or iOS devices, whether it be iPad or iPhone. Uh, and then recently in the last year, and it's going into our scope and sequence, is uh, the school here has 
really started to integrate Google Classroom, which includes Docs and Slides, which are their version of Word and PowerPoint. A um, couple of nice things about that is uh, documents can be made accessible very easily. Um, teachers can push, can make one thing and push it out to everybody at one time. And students can be in one document collaborating. So you can have four students in one, in one document. So they're working together on four different devices, but within one document or within one presentation. Um, and that works with enlargement, that works with screen readers fairly well. But it, ta it takes time to learn how to do that. Um, I'm just gonna show a real quick, I'm gonna show part of a real quick video. It, this is from a, a group called um, AIM, uh, Accessible Educational Materials at the CAST Center. And they do a lot with you know, working with states and working with schools to, um, to help students and adults and teachers get accessible educational materials. Um, and the reason I'm just going to show this a little bit is this is a student who they've highlighted who was a high school student who uh, went on to attend Harvard and uses four to five different tools at any given time. So now not everyone is going to do you know, these sorts of things, but it, it just sort of highlights that you want to take a look at all available tools, um, use them systematically, see how you're going to integrate them. Um, but something like a checklist or something, you know, or, and you want to fall back on your assessment of what does a student need, what do they need to do, and how do they need to access their world and their, their environment um, in, a, in a way that makes sense for them and for everybody else. Oop, and it didn't. Let's try this again. There we go. Based on the setting and the instructional content, Ewing uses all four specialized formats, Braille, large print, audio, and digital text. The TBI reports that they have difficulty obtaining hard copy large print. So, as an alternative, they use enlarged text on the computer and assistive technology, such as CCTVs and handheld magnifiers to assist data in reading print materials. The brand that you use it can be in the form of a hard copy piece of paper, but she also uses electronic braille. Using the brain, no paper. Her print is primarily using a CCTV or a Ruby handheld magnifier or a dual text on the PC. She has emailed computer files to get an open on file and to use the uh, Zoom text to be able to access what information is there. What's the best thing? All right, so I'm going to stop the video there at this point. So I, I just wanted to show that she was using a variety of tools for different reasons. Um, and, you know, I, I like the piece at the beginning where they said getting hard copy large print was difficult. I think when students are in K through 12, it, it's time consuming and it's expensive, but you can get it most of the time fairly easily. But once a student leaves high school, getting large print is extremely difficult and very expensive. So having students learn those tools on a PC where they can take any any format like a PDF or a Word document and make it as big as they need and change the color and the contrast to fit their needs is that student will be much better served and be much more prepared for college and career than a student who's only ever using huge books in large print. Um, you know just as an example you know not that there are many bookstores you know hard you know brick and mortar bookstores left, but if you go to any of them, the large print section is probably one shelf in the back corner somewhere. You know, so and that's pretty common to both, you know, the commercial world and to college and or in a, in a job setting. Um, just trying to get large print in a job setting is very difficult as well. So as I said, filling the toolbox, and this is this is again, you know, we can we can go and talk about note takers and other things as well. But what we broke our, our scope and sequence down into was looking at these areas that are up there now. And I'll read them off. Uh, computer operations, which is sort of the basic nuts and bolts of just moving around any computer or any PC, any Windows-based PC. So how do you turn it on? How do you turn it off? How do you save? How do you uh, use the start menu? Uh, keyboarding, which is extremely important because if a student's going to be using a, a computer or even an iPad as their primary device, you want them to be fairly quick at you know typing and keyboarding because that is their their main way of inputting and out you know and getting at information out. 
So while it, you know, it, it can seem that, oh, who needs, you know, who needs the keyboard? It, I would advocate that you want to hit this skill as hard as you can, as early as you can. Um, then, you know, we talk about internet access. Um, we use a lot of Google based things here, but you know, our scope and sequence is a little bit more uh, agnostic to, to what you're using. So there are people who use Firefox, there are people who use Chrome, uh, Internet Explorer, you know, whatever is, is available. So we try to keep it a little bit more um, basic to though, you know, instead of looking at one product or another. Certainly use of email uh, as students go through high school or even middle school. I even, you know, here even elementary to a point, we have students who are receiving things from their teachers through email and they're sending um, assignments back through email. And then we hit some of the, ba you know, the, the, the very basic and more, most commonly used things in, in any place, Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, Microsoft Excel, and then the related iPad app. So Microsoft has some really nice, very accessible, both for screen reader users and for enlargement users, um, apps that are Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. And then finally, we, um, we recently put a, a bigger push into Google. Uh, another thing, the other reason we, we switched to Google as well and we use that is um, everything that a student does is saved on the cloud. So they save it in a Google Drive. So if a device breaks or gets dropped or something along those lines, a student, you know, we can switch out a computer and a student hasn't lost anything. Where in the past, uh, especially with our with our PCs and our iPads, if a student were to lose something or to drop something, we have to replace it. They could very possibly lose all the work they were doing. But with Google Drive, that's that's not happening. Not that they're not breaking things, but they're not losing their you know two months worth of work that they've just done. So we're going to bring up this uh, you know a draft that you you can see. Take a look. Uh, that's been in in use here, but it's in draft form now because it's. Um, you know, we're, we're in the process of updating it. You can kind of see we have multiple copies where we break it down by grade, you know, like single grade level skills are in one document, but this is sort of our, our core document of, you know, what's the skill? In red, we have things that are for screen reader or JAWS users. Um, we have in blue things that are specific to enlargement users, specifically Zoom text, because that's what we've been using. And then the green items are iPad based skills. So you can see we break it down by, you know, we break it down by grade and we look at, you know, so when I have something like listed here as first grade, what I'm saying is, what we're saying is, is, is the goal is that by the end of first grade, the student can do that skill. So it's not that they're going to come into first grade with this skill, they're going to leave with this skill. You know, and that the nice thing about this checklist is as students are moving from first grade up to second grade, the checklist can be passed from one teacher to the next. So the next teacher knows, well, okay, well, this student didn't achieve everything that they, all the first grade skills. So we still have to back map and work on those a little bit as we integrate the second grade skills as well. I'll just move down quick. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, it's a fairly long document because it covers a lot of grades, but you can see, you know, we spend a lot of time on those foundational computer operation skills. You know, it goes on for, for a number of pages here before we get to even keyboarding. But again, those things are, you know, it, we're not, it's not built necessarily sequentially in, the, in its headings. It's more in the grade levels. So, and you know, we have keyboarding, you see we have a first grade skill. So that doesn't mean we're not working on keyboarding in some cases in kindergarten. We just don't necessarily expect a student to be independent using navigation keys in kindergarten. Not that they wouldn't be using those skills at that time. Then you can see some of our notes there on the side as we're in the process of, of updating. So we have keyboarding and then we jump to internet access. Um, email I believe is next. Um, and then we get into our applications like Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. And I'm just going to jump to the bottom very quickly here. You can see Word for iPad, and then we have PowerPoint, and then we jump you know, Excel, and we do the same for the iPad apps. And then you can see at the, at the end here we have a lot. This is where we're adding all of those Google-based. So this is more specific to Google. It doesn't necessarily have to be in Chrome, but it's, it's definitely more specific to those Google pieces of software. 
Did I hear? Oh, there we go. So that's sort of a very, very quick rundown of what this looks like and how, you know, and what we're using to track students. And we've turned those things, that, that very long document into individual checklists by grade so teachers can use those as a, uh, uh, as a tool. Um, oh, our internet connection is unstable. Let's open it. <laughs> um, so as you can see, so the sequence is built, you know, we, you know, basic navigation up to much more complex um, skills. You know, much more complex apps, much more complex skills. Um, benchmarks are, you know, by grade level. We can track. And the nice thing is, it says here, back map to write goals and objectives. So what, what we expect a seventh grader to be able to do is we're going to look at all those skills that you should be able to do by seventh grade. And if there's something that's missing there, well, now we know what our present levels of performance are. And we, can, we know what our strengths are. We know what our needs are. And then we can write our, our goals and objectives in the IEP based on where, where there's a gap area and what needs to be worked on. Uh, and, you know, and then, and then not spend as much time focusing on those things that a student can already do well. Not that they're not going to do them, but they may not need someone to sit there and instruct them for those skills. Um, you know, and these skills are not to, you know, should not be in isolation. They are, they are necessary for access to school and personal items. Uh, educational and uh, educational assessment resources are becoming much more they're increasingly being put online for those who are in Maryland will know of things like the park assessments and the new um, science assessments that are coming out, which do have paper versions, but are really intended to be online exams. And even other, you know, I know places use benchmarking exams like such as MAP or there's a couple others that they take throughout the year. So here I just pulled up the park testing website and you can see you know there are paper and hard copy braille versions but they've really you know put most of their time and resource into making computer-based tests and these tests are accessible by students who are either enlargement users or screen reader users or even other types of assistive technology but if a student is not independent and comfortable with their technology you don't want to throw them into a testing situation because they want you want them to concentrate on the tests, not on the technology. Um, so while I say you can use this as a sort of a as a gauge, um, not that we're teaching to a test, but you can use you know can a student sit in a room by themselves and take this test using their technology? That can be your gauge as to are they independent. And then, sorry, and then certainly we talk about college and career readiness, uh, which is really what we're, our goal for any student is, is by the time they leave us in the school, whether it be here or in a public school or in some other private school, that they are ready to go off to college to, to start a career. Um, and they need to be able to talk about the tools they can use, understand the tools, and then explain them to others um, because teachers and, and, and aides don't exist outside of a of a K through 12 environment for the most part. Uh, and then focus. You know, how are you focusing your time and energy? Technology, you know, accessibility have improved just hugely over the last few years. So we have, you know, we, PCs, MacBooks, iPads, iPhones, all of these things come with some very nice, to varying degrees, very nice built-in access or assistive technology so screen readers screen enlargers um you know the things that we can do now it, things like google were not possible a few years ago and i remember starting you know as as a younger teacher having to do a lot of things a lot more by hand or transfer everything you know was a very hard you know it was a long process whereas now most of these things can be downloaded in seconds or can be typed up and just emailed or put in a, in a folder somewhere and a student can access it immediately. Um, yes, technology is never a replacement for reading or math literacy. And I, I always throw this in in anything I talk about because especially in younger grades, those kindergartners through third graders is you want to spend as much time as you can getting them reading and writing. That's, that's going to be your biggest impact area. Now you certainly can integrate technology into that, 
but that should not be the focus of their day. Their focus should be, can they read? Can they write? Can that be, that could be print, that could be braille, that could be some other sort of assistive technology for students that need, you know, that can't physically write or they can't physically braille. What does that mean? And that's, that's a sort of a different, slightly different topic, but that's where you want to put your energy, especially in those younger grades or as students age, if they are, you know, at a point where they were print readers and they're now becoming braille readers, you want to spend as much time on that piece as well because that is their literacy and they're they're losing one form of literacy but you want to make sure you they get another before it's too you know before it goes on for too long um you know the educational team at you know with the parents should be using curriculums and assessments um you know technology assessments or educational assessments to to come up with those priorities is the priority reading or is the priority accessing google or accessing email and that only you know, the team working together and assessing a student in some sort of systematic way are going to be able to answer those questions well and answer the questions in a way that are going to make sure the student can, is making progress both educationally but also in access. Um, I, and I wrote, you know, this, this fourth bullet, consider the tools the school's already using. So Things like note takers and CCTVs are great, and I, I certainly advocate that students learn how to use those things. Um, but you know, also think about what is you know your child who's blind or visually impaired. They're sitting next to, you know, they're sitting in a class of thirty other kids. What are the thirty other kids using? And is that something that our student, you know, your student or your child can use? But you know, they may need some alternative access. Um, but if they can be using the same tools as everybody else, they're gonna, their ability to collaborate is going to be um, in, in much improved, and their ability to learn is going to be much improved because they're collaborating with their peers. Uh, and then it's certainly any intervention should be based on, uh, on assessed need. So, you know, use of a, you know, electronic magnification, use of a screen reader, use of a braille display. Um, and, and, and gear it towards the task. What, you know, what is expected of any student or any child sitting in a class? What, is, what, do they, what does any student sitting in that class need to be able to do to produce to show evidence of learning? It shouldn't be any different for the blind or visually impaired student. It's just their, abil their, their, their format may, may be different. And moving kind of quickly, but you're supporting, you know, supporting your child at home. So again, you know, I always say, and this goes both ways, educational teams always need to, should always be working with the parents and the parents should always be working with the educational team to understand what are the strengths, what are the needs, what is that, what does that student, what does that child need to be successful in ninth grade algebra or in third grade reading class? What do they need to be successful at that time? And how can you put the tools in place and the supports in place um, to, to make sure that it's being done both in the school and at home? You know, things at home, especially, you know, as kids are learning technology, you want to try to make it as fun and as functional as possible. So certainly there are games on iPads and games on PCs that, that help to teach some of these things, depending on, you know, you know, which, which area you're talking about, or, you know, as a, you know, if you have a, 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 especially a younger student or, you know, even in the high school that really enjoys reading, there are great reading apps, both that you can do, you know, auditory, visually, or in Braille that allow access to any book of interest that a student might have. So you want to spend, you make sure that they have access to those things, because um, they're going to be learning those skills that they need to navigate around a device while they are reading something they want to read. Um, and this goes both for the parents and the teachers is the, the kids are often going to pick up this stuff quicker than anybody else. So have them, have them bring home what they're doing and show you what they're doing. You know, they're going to want to teach you and then you're going to be able to give some of that support as they are moving into more complex academics and more complex skills uh, that require more steps you may have a base as to how are you going to assist them at that time. Um, and then the thing, you know, I always try to remind everyone is this, this, you know, especially with technology, this is a journey with a moving destination is what is out now for access will look, may look very different in five years, may look very different next year. Um, you know, and schools are always looking to put in the most innovative tools and figure out 
how do we best serve our students? Um, so what, what a student's learning now certainly won't go to waste, but remember that in, in five years, if you have a, especially a younger student, a younger child who's maybe in elementary, by the time they get to high school, the tools that are out there and what a, that high school is going to be using may be, look very different than they are now. So you want to make sure that, um, that they are being assessed, even not, not a necessarily a formal assessment. It can just, you know, be what a teacher sees or what the educational team sees as a group. But you want to make sure there's sort of a continual conversation as to, well, is this tool still the most appropriate one or do we need to introduce something else? And then finally, we will move to questions. So we've got a couple of things that came up on the chat here. So um, I can try to un... Mute everybody if I can figure out how to do that. Maybe I should stop sharing for now. Sorry, everyone gets to listen to me and figure out what we're doing here. Oh, here we go. Stop sharing. All right. And where is the... All right. Well, if you can you know, put up a, a, you know, something in the chat, if you have a question, I'll certainly try to answer. So I hear, um, where can we look for the state and industry standards? So that'll be uh, that you know, ISTE was one and um, the state uh, uh, technology literacy standards. And those links are both in the PowerPoint. And they'll be up and they'll be available for people to look at. Um, and will the presentation be archived and accessible later? Yes, we'll make sure that, you know, uh, and I'm sure we can get that link sent out to, you know, to whoever's on the, on the mailing list. I'm, I'm assuming there's a mailing list that this, yes. yeah, that people have got this. And then the, the link for the next uh, webinar will be on there. Just okay. Because we have it. Um, and um, the, uh, the scope and sequence that I showed you, again, we're in the midst of updating it. You, the, the draft will be done here very shortly. And I'm going to make sure that that also ends up on the Maryland School for the Blind website. Um, curriculum section. So that'll be accessible to teachers and parents as well. So, any other questions? Anything in the chat? Anyone want to throw anything in the chat? Feel free and give another minute or two and then I will turn it back over to Renee. All right. Don't know if anyone's typing, but I will turn it back over anyway. So thank you, everybody. So I just wanted to let you know, um, if you're not on our mailing list, um, one thing that you can do is you can email me and send, and I can get your email address that way. Um, my email address is Renee, R-E-N-E-E-K, at M-D-S-C-H-E-L-I-N-D dot O-R-G. Um, and just email me, um, and I think you could probably also find my email address on our website too. Um, but we'll get you on our mailing list if you're not receiving this stuff, um, if you're just getting this from your uh, child's TBI at school. Um, I also wanted to add one more thing about um, the technology and how it changes so rapidly. Um, I really would encourage you not to go out and purchase, um, if, especially if your child's really young, um, go out and purchase um, any type of technology like that, that you know, your child's receiving it at school. Um, I would, um, just maybe uh, talk to your child's TBI and see, you know, I'm sure that you can um, get a duplicate for home. Um, you know, just discuss that with them. I, we did not purchase any technology for my daughter until this past year um, when she graduated high school. So, um, and I think that there's probably programs where you can kind of um, trade things in and, and get something for uh, the older versions. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that because it's just, it just gets overwhelming. So um, I also wanted to let you know that our next uh, webinar is going to be, we're going to have one a month, um, focusing on different, uh, we're going to have different presenters and different subjects, um, is December 12th. And uh, Susan Vanderhoff is going to be presenting. Um, she is our outreach uh, social worker. And uh, the title of her presentation is Social Skills for Independence. Um, I know that just from uh, parent feedback that um, other than technology, um, social skills and daily living skills are, are really high up there on the list of, of the 
the different things our, our kids kind of fall behind with. Um, so I, I hope that you can join us. And if you know any other parents that you think would benefit from that, please uh, let them know. And um, also, if you could email me and we can get them on the list as well. So um, do you have any more questions? Um, so I know a couple of people asked about the emails and I put those into the chat box. Oh, great. So thanks. Uh, and mine, you know, when we get the uh, presentation up, I'll, my, my email's in the presentation right. as well. And I can also be found on MSB's website. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I hope uh, you'll join us again for the rest of the year. All right. Thank you, everybody.